Hi everyone and welcome back to my channel. If you don't know me yet, my name is Angelica Baum and I'm a belief change coach and relationship coach. Today I'm joined by my colleague at the Awakening Health Clinic here in Burlington, Ontario. Her name is Dr. Felicia Sensa. She's a fabulous naturopathic doctor with a passion for holistic well-being. And of course, an expert when it comes to herbs and natural solutions. Today, we're excited to dive into the fascinating world of sleep from both the naturopathic perspective Felicia has and also from the perspective of the impact relationships have on our sleep quality. At a later point in the conversation, I will also be able to introduce another colleague from the Awakening Health Clinic a physiotherapist and myofacial release practitioner, Dan Bozzi, for his perspective on the topic sleep. So first of all, welcome, Felicia. Thank you so much. I'm so excited to explore sleep, something that's so important to our overall health and wellness. For sure. All right, let's maybe start by addressing the basics. People often ask how many hours of sleep one should ideally get some people say seven hours eight hours nine hours I think sleep needs can vary quite a bit from person to person right yeah absolutely that's always my favorite question because (laughs) there's no good answer for it it depends on each person so how can you tell if you're getting enough sleep yeah so that's a great question like I said enough sleep depends on each person's individual body needs their activities. There's a lot of different factors that go into that. To know if you're getting enough sleep, it's important to kind of ask yourself a couple questions. So paying attention to sort of how you're feeling. Do you wake up refreshed in the morning and ready to start your day? Or are you kind of feeling groggy and tired? That's something to pay attention to. Um, Are you able to sleep through the night? It's another good question to ask yourself. Are you waking up frequently? Do you maybe have difficulty falling asleep? So those are important things to look at as well. And then paying attention to your energy throughout the day too. So do you have enough energy to do what you want to do in the day? And seeing if sleep is maybe a factor there too. Yeah, so these are all sort of things that you can ask yourself, pay attention to get some insight into what your sleep is like and adjust as necessary. So if you're feeling tired and you're not sleeping through the night, adjusting those things and trying to figure out how you can get more sleep to have more energy throughout your day. Great. Those are very helpful questions for sure. Some people use sleep trackers. What's your take on those? Yeah. So I think those are super fascinating. It's amazing how far technology has come where we can kind of monitor our sleep in such a specific way. My only caution with those is I often find they can lead to a bit of a disconnect with your your body and your sleep. So a lot of the time when I ask, what's your sleep like? The tracker comes out and it's like, well, let me check my tracker. So using those as a helpful tool, but being careful not to lose that connection with your body and knowing what your sleep is like just through intuition and feeling your energy and the questions we just talked about too. Yeah, when we talked about this before, and you mentioned an app worth sleepiness scale. Can you say a little bit more about that? Yeah, so the app worth sleepiness scale is just sort of an eight question self report questionnaire. It asks questions about your kind of daily activities and how likely you are to fall asleep during those activities. It gives an indicator of whether or not you're sleeping well or if there might be an issue there, and then following up with a healthcare provider if there is. Very interesting. So people could find that if they just Google that term, they could find this questionnaire online. Yeah, absolutely. It's just the Upworth Sleepiness Scale. Mm -hmm. I'll put it in the notes below as well. Okay, well, let's look at some factors that affect our sleep quality. The first thing that comes to my mind is our overall fast-paced nature in our modern life another thing that I think of is screen time either late screen time or too much screen time Uh, bright lights at night that disturb our biorhythm 
personally, I don't like to have a TV in the bedroom. I know that affects my sleep. And I've heard a recommendation that we should shut off all our screens. So our phone, our computer, any other devices we have at least an hour before bedtime. Do you agree? And do you have some other recommendations to counteract these influences of our modern life? Yeah, absolutely. I I definitely agree with that. It's something that I struggle with personally, too. You want to check that last message before bed or check your emails before going to bed. I think for the screen time aspect of it, it's really important to sort of give your eyes that rest before bed. But also for the the stimulating component of it, if you're checking your emails and you spot an email that needs to be addressed, it's going to be difficult to sleep after seeing something like that. So I think taking that hour before bed to yourself, maybe have a tea, some relaxing time, that's a great approach. Um, And then there are all sorts of things like the blue light filters and all those other things. But I think the best approach is just turning off the screen an hour before bed or sooner if you can. Very good. So giving yourself that gift to just switch off and not be in work mode anymore or even needing to be accessible all the time. It's crazy how we've gotten so used to at any point, anybody can reach us and should reach us. Yeah, exactly. What do you think about naps during the day? Yeah, it kind of depends person to person and your energy needs and all of that. I find it's at least important to take a rest during the day, whether it's a nap or it's kind of time for tea or something like that. If you're sort of going all day, it can be difficult to then quiet down at the end of the day. Um, So taking a rest break somewhere in the day, I think is important, whether it's a quick nap or like a tea or some meditation time, just having little breaks in the day. Nice. So people who say, I can't nap, you would recommend to at least take a break, to sit down, have some quiet time. Yeah. uh, Slow down. Yeah. Absolutely. I like to say it kind of reminds the body how to relax so that you're ready to relax at the end of the day. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. If we go, go, go all day, how can our body be expected to then suddenly switch off at night? Mm -hmm. Good point. For me, hormonal imbalances as I was going through menopause affected my sleep at one point. And that's where actually you and another colleague of yours, another naturopathic colleague have helped me. Can you name some other factors that affect our sleep? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So hormonal imbalances is a great one to mention addressing those eating before bed that's something to pay attention to and you'll hear me say this a lot throughout this talk everyone's individual so you really have to get into with your body and what works for your body but generally i find eating before bed is not a great idea just because your body's now having to work to that instead of just sort of resting and recovering throughout the night so, so ideally you're... how long should we have a break before we go to sleep after eating yeah i'd say a couple hours again it sort of depends on on the person i have some patients that do really well with intermittent fasting and will stop eating after their dinner some patients like to have a little bit of a snack before bed and i i think that's okay like a small snack but usually you're wanting to go for something that's easy to digest i've often suggested things like a handful of nuts before bed or having a date or something like that. If you're feeling the need to eat, at least it's a small, easy to digest meal or not even a meal, but more of a snack. So that's kind of one of the factors, the food before bed. If you're having something that's very high in sugars or processed ingredients, then your body's going to have to work extra hard to break that down and it might also affect your sugar levels and prevent sleep throughout the night. That goes for even things like alcohol before bed. So sometimes people will tell me, oh, I just have that glass of wine before bed to calm down. And that might kind of calm down before bed, but then it prevents restful sleep throughout the night because of the way it impacts your body. I'm paying attention to things like that. If anything, maybe have a tea before bed. 
I like a calming, relaxing tea. <laughs> I know you even make your own teas that help with sleep, right? There's certain herbs from your garden that you make tea out of, correct? Yes, absolutely. And we'll definitely talk a little bit later about herbs that can help with sleep too. So other factors that can affect sleep is a bedtime routine. So that's kind of where the tea comes in as well. So having a routine before bed just to kind of let your body know, okay, it's time to rest, relax, have a good sleep. Another important one is activity throughout the day. So if you're not getting enough movement in your day, then it's going to be hard to sleep at night because you haven't really moved your body, expended energy. That's important. Again, it's important to find what works for you, what kind of exercise works for you. Usually people have to play around a bit with that before they figure out what works best for them. But generally making sure to get movement in your day can help for sure. And then there's things like noise. So a partner, kids, pets jumping in the bed, all those sorts of things affect sleep as well. And then that's another one. That's a common one I hear. I can't quiet my mind before going to bed. So that's one as well. Yeah, some things that certainly help with that is little techniques like have a pen and paper by your bed and as you're lying in bed and you're thinking of your to-do list you can scribble something down and of course people would say I can take notes on my phone but then you're again opening up the electronics and you're on your screen so simply the old-fashioned way of scribbling something down and that way you can let it go you know you won't forget it Meditation, of course, helps or self-hypnosis. That's something I teach people. I've also made sleep recordings for people specifically to either go to sleep or when they wake up at night to go back to sleep. So there's lots of things we can do as we're lying awake and anxiety takes over, our thoughts take over, our busy mind starts going. Mm -hmm. The next question I have for you is, being older myself and just thinking even of older folks, they seem to wake up during the night because they have to go to the washroom to empty their bladder. And that's, of course, a sleep interruption. So do you have any advice what folks can do to reduce or maybe even totally cut out those trips to the bathroom? Yeah, that's a great question. It's something that I see often. My advice there would be to get to the root cause of, of why you're having to urinate at night. In older men, it's often prostate issues can come into play. So addressing those, that can help with frequent urination in the night. Or maybe there's some issues with pelvic floor muscles in women or men. So addressing those can help. And then just being mindful of kind of how much liquid you're consuming before bed. If you're someone who gets up frequently at night to go to the washroom, maybe a tea before bed isn't the best approach for you. So paying attention to those sort of things. Another thing I found can be really helpful as well is making sure that during the day, before it gets too late at night, you're getting enough fluid in, but also making sure that you're getting enough electrolytes in as well, because that can really help with kidney function and all of that too. And then speaking of the kidneys, in traditional Chinese medicine, the kidneys get depleted as you age. So making sure that you're taking care of your TCM kidneys. The ways to do that is things like Tai Chi, Qigong. There are certain herbs that can help as well and things that help manage the stress response. Those are all things that can help as well. Wow, very interesting. There was actually a lot of information in what you just said, starting with the pelvic floor. I think a pelvic floor specialist is actually a great person to go to. Too many people do not even think of that possibility, right? So I'm very mm -hmm. much for that. I think it's interesting what we can do with Chinese medicine, herbs, to get the kidney meridian and the kidney energy up. Fabulous. Can you elaborate a little bit more on the electrolytes in the fluids? I don't know if everybody who's listening is aware of what that means. Yeah. So when you're drinking something, there's water and then there's things like sodium and potassium, which help your body function as well and help your cells generate energy. When we sweat, when we 
lose fluid, we're usually not just losing water. In that water is sodium, potassium. And then as we use energy, we're also using glucose, which is another thing that's often considered an electrolyte. So when you're expending energy, you're sweating, you want to replace all of those components, not just the water. So what would you drink then? Water and what would you put in? Let's break it down, make it really easy. Yeah. So you would drink water and then you can put in some sea salt. I'll often add lemon as well. Maple syrup to that too. That would cover your electrolyte. And I can share a specific recipe with you too that you can add in the comments for people who are interested. Wonderful. Good. Now I'm very pleased to introduce our colleague, Dan Bosi. He's the physiotherapist and myofacial release practitioner at Awakening Health Clinic here in Burlington. Welcome, Thank Dan. You. Thank you for having me. He can only join us for a little bit, but that gives me the opportunity to ask him a couple of questions and to get his point of view. So people are often interested in, is there a good pillow? Is there a good sleeping position that I should take. Let's maybe start with the pillow. As a physiotherapist, what pillow would you recommend? Well, there's no one pillow that actually is right for everybody or even for one particular person. Part of the issue is that we need to have enough support. So if a person sleeps on their side and that's the position they predominantly sleep in, you need to basically fill in the gap from their shoulder to their head. And that can vary actually a little bit on terms of exactly how they sleep on their side. But the main thing is that you need to be able to fill in that space there so your head isn't tilted to one side or the other. That tilt to one side or the other is what causes people problems when they wake up in the morning and they feel a crick in their neck. Sometimes people will actually get one thick pillow that will end up filling in the whole gap. Other times people will get two pillows and put them together because if they don't sleep just solely on their sides, you need to be able to take a pillow out so you can sleep on your back, for example. So that's the first thing. Now, if a person sleeps in multiple positions, like on their back, it depends also on how much curve they have and how much conversation they have to do so they can sleep comfortably on their back. A lot of times people will actually use too many pillows on their back and push their heads forward. And that's not good either. You want to have enough so that it supports you so your head's not tilted back. Some people who have really good posture, they're not going to need any pillow in order to sleep comfortably on their back because they're going to be able to lie flat on their back without any issues. Now, the other thing is that if a person has back problems and they sleep on their sides, it's often helpful to put a pillow between the knees. That pillow between the knees helps keep the alignment through your back so you're not twisted in one way or the other. Basically, the whole idea is that you want your spine to be in the mid position because that's the position where there's the most range and movement. When you get moved into a position um, where things are turned or twisted and they're closer to the end of the range, that's where people get into problems. One other thing that they can do is sleeping on their side is they can use like a body pillow and that helps with their arm if they're having arm problems as well. They can hold on to the pillow, keep their arm from falling across their body. And then that pillow can also go down in between their legs. If they really want to sleep only on their back, they can also put some pillows behind their back so they can't roll onto the other side. They have to actually physically move towards the other side. So that's essentially what I tell people that it's more important what you're doing with the pillow than what, what pillow it is. Very good. That's very interesting to know. So for the side sleeper, a bigger pillow. For the back sleeper, a smaller pillow. If you do both, two pillows or also thinking as a side sleeper of the pillow between your knees. I do that actually. That's very comfortable. And then that body pillow is also a fabulous idea. Would you know where to buy a body pillow? Well, usually body pillows can be found online. Amazon is usually a good place to look for them. But there's also other places where we are in Canada. Anywhere that sells pillows will often sell body pillows as well. That tends to be a little bit easier to find than it used to be. Okay, good. And what mattress would you recommend? So the mattress is also more important, whether or not you need the support and thickness of the mattress or and how much cushion you need. And really the mattress is more important that there's enough support underneath the cushion that it helps you be able to maintain the position. A lot of companies nowadays, they provide you a 90 day sleep guarantee that you can try out the mattresses because if you lie on a mattress in the store, 
you're only there for maybe 10, 15 minutes, and it really doesn't give you an idea of how that mattress is. So find something that you feel a little bit comfortable at the store, then you can try it at home and return if it's not something that works for you. There's a lot of different types of mattresses. You can get the regular standard mattresses. You can get a really plush cushion mattress. You can get the memory foam mattresses, which kind of mold a little more to your body. Each one has their pros and cons. Some people will talk to me and they'll say, I get really hot underneath the mattress. Well, then maybe you need something that yeah, breathes a little bit more so you get a little more airflow. Some people say they're, they're really cold and then they don't need that airflow. So they don't need to spend that extra money in order to get that type of mattress. It sounds like we need to do a little bit of research when we're buying a yes. mattress and take yeah. our time and really consider it well. Yeah, you don't want to be on a mattress that sags because that mattress will end up forcing you into a position that you may not want to be in. And so if your mattress is getting old and it's starting to sag, then that's a time where it's probably a good idea for a replacement. Good. Yeah, an important investment in our sleep health. We spend a lot of time on our bed. That's yeah. true, for sure. In the following segment, I am going to talk a little bit about snoring and also how that impacts our relationships. Is there a specific sleep position that is better for snorers so that they snore less? What would you say? The position that tends to be the worst for people who snore is on their back. And that's because when they're lying on their back, their tongue ends up falling back in, in, towards their throat and including the airway, which is what causes the snoring. Sleeping on your side, it tends to be better. And you may have noticed that I haven't talked about sleeping on your stomach because even though there are people who sleep on their stomach, the biggest problem with people sleeping on stomach is that they end up having neck problems because their head's turned so much to one side. And some of that can be mitigated by using pillows and, and having them underneath your chest. But side or stomach tend to be better for people who snore because that tongue doesn't fall back into their mouth. There's really nothing that will prevent someone who doesn't have enough space in their airway from snoring, but those two positions tend to be a little bit better than on your back. Yeah, good. What if I have a shoulder pain, my shoulder hurts, and I can't sleep on my side? What can I do? If you can sleep on your back, then sleep on your back and put a pillow underneath your arm and through here so that when your arm comes down, it's supported and it's put more into the resting position. Because at your side is not really the resting position. The resting position is a little bit forward and a little bit out. And so that's the position where the shoulder has the most space. And that's why it's the best position for that. For a person who can't sleep on their back, then you have to modify the position that they're sleeping on their side. Most of the time, if people have a rotator cuff problem, they can't sleep on the point of their shoulder. They have to sleep with the weight on the back part and on the shoulder blade. And so you end up sleeping on a little bit of an angle. This is where having a pillow behind their back to prevent them from rolling and twisting through their spine can be helpful so that they can sleep on their side a little bit easier. So you do what people would do if they are someone who sleeps on their stomach where you have a pillow and you roll into the pillow, but you're still mostly on your side. And you can also use the pillow and through the back. That helps push the shoulder back into the sock. Those are a couple of things you can do for people who have shoulder issues. I've been there. Well, thank you so much. That was all very illuminating and helpful. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. All right. Have a good day. Bye. Okay. Well, shall we dive a little bit into relationships? Yeah, let's do it. Relationships can definitely impact our sleep. And you would be the one to know. Yeah, sleep and relationships, six, right? They mutually affect each other. Our quality of sleep, of course, affects our relationships positively or negatively. We all know how the world can look so very different and sometimes overwhelming with lack of sleep. And that means in our relationships, we are impatient we're not really our best selves while on the other hand with better sleep our mind is clearer we're calmer we have more empathy for our partner we are better at focusing at communicating in general and problem solving of course so just as sleep affects our relationships our relationships also affect our sleep and again positively or negatively because conflicts, fights, or maybe worries I have about my relationship affect our ability 
to sleep in a negative way. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering, do you think sleeping in the same bed with our partner leads to better sleep? Mm, that's a great question, Felicia. Research actually suggests that sharing a bed with a loved one is positive. It promotes feelings of safety. It lowers the cortisol, the stress hormone, and it increases oxytocin, which is the bonding hormone or love hormone is also what it's called. Oxytocin reduces anxiety and relaxes you. And it even makes you sleepy. And studies in Germany have also shown that couples who spend the night in the same bed experience longer periods of REM sleep. And REM is crucial for the brain rejuvenation and dreaming. And dreaming, again, is important because it allows our subconscious mind to process the experiences we had during the day. Though sleeping in the same bed can contribute to better sleep quality, provided that the relationship is overall good. That's so interesting. I guess my follow-up question to that would be, what if sleeping in the same bed isn't ideal for some couples? Yeah, that's a very good follow-up question because it's, of course, not just conflicts or problems in our relationships that impact our sleep. Sometimes partners have different sleep preferences, and that could be due to different schedules, different work schedules, for example, or simply biological differences. Our natural sleep patterns, whether we tend to be night owls or early risers, they are largely genetic. And some couples are just not compatible in those preferences. I've actually heard an interesting story why we have these differences in our sleep preferences. And that goes all the way back to our ancestors. It has evolutionary reasons. Because when our ancestors used to live together in big tribes, it was very useful when some people in the tribe needed to go to sleep earlier, but would also wake up earlier. And other people in the group went to bed later, but also slept longer. Because that meant that there were only so many hours during the night where nobody was awake and it was overall safer for the tribe. That's so interesting. So remembering that means this is genetic this is nothing we can change and we shouldn't try to change it forcing a partner to stay up later or the other partner to go to bed earlier is not a good idea trying to change your natural sleep cycle that can cause insomnia and frustration and then ultimately relationship problems so that's not the right approach also, if we keep in mind that the most valuable time for a couple is actually the time in bed before we fall asleep, when we can cuddle with our partner and connect and be intimate, it's easy to find a solution here. I recommend that you get ready for bed together and the later sleeping partner can just get up again quietly and then go back to bed and to sleep when they are ready. But you have that time together when you can cuddle, connect, touch, and have all the advantages of that. Hmm, that's so interesting and would be a good bedtime routine as well. Yes, uh, absolutely. <laughs> Let's have a tea together and then go to bed together. <laughs> yeah, that's perfect. We have um, to find some other things for people who don't like tea. <laughs> yes. What about sound disturbances, like if the partner snores? Absolutely. Actually, some studies suggest that women sleep less deeply when they share a bed with their romantic partner and men sleep better when they sleep next to their partner, which I find really interesting. And some female clients have told me that it has literally saved their marriage to sleep in separate beds because of their partner's loud snoring. And not just separate beds, but separate rooms. Because loud snoring or unaddressed sleep apnea can, of course, be a recipe for stress and for growing resentment. And <laughs> one client said so nicely, well, now that we have separate rooms, I don't wake up in the morning anymore ready to kill my husband, but I'm actually really happy to see him in the morning. So in those cases, what is called a sleep divorce would be a good idea. That means sleeping in separate rooms. It's actually quite a practical solution. However, if you choose that sleep divorce, just make sure that 
you maintain the physical intimacy and the connection through cuddling and touching at other times during the day. Mm, that sounds like a, like a great practical way of addressing snoring. Well, talking about small snoring, what do you tell your patients when they ask for natural solutions that help with snoring? Yeah, so it's always really important to address the cause of the snoring. So whether that's allergies, addressing the allergies, and maybe adding a diffuser with eucalyptus to the room or something to kind of help with that congestion, or looking at things like you mentioned sleep apnea, that can be a cause of snoring for sure. So looking into whether there's undiagnosed sleep apnea happening, and then making sure you're doing things like exercising throughout the day, maintaining a healthy weight and proper nutrition, and all of that can, can help with snoring. Yeah, interesting. We like the essential oils in the diffuser, especially in the winter when the air is dry. That helps quite a bit to breathe better. What do you think of taping your mouth so that you don't breathe through your mouth and also snore less, but that you're forced to breathe through your nose for those people who are used to sleeping with a mouth open and breathing that way? Yeah, that's an interesting question. I've had people try that and that with great results. Some people are a lot more hesitant to try something like that. It's been a while since I've looked into any research on that. So I'd have to dig to see what the research says. But I have people say that that's helped a lot and helped them clear their nasal passages because they're using them more and just sort of training themselves to breathe through their nose instead of their mouth, which overall can be a great thing as well because our nose acts as more of a natural filter than our mouth. So you're filtering the air more if you're breathing through your nose than your mouth. Yeah, very good. And you can even use tape uh, for sensitive skin that you can just get at the drugstore or the specific tape you can use. I've seen stuff like that on Amazon where you can order specific tape to help you with that issue. Yeah, yeah. Anyways, it's all about creative compromises, right? When it comes to <laughs> how we sleep at night, whether we snore or not. Another compromise for couples that comes to mind is that they maybe agree to sleep together in the same room, let's say during the weekend, but not during the week when everybody has to get up early and function at work. There is different ways if we just are willing to be a little flexible and creative. Because even though sleeping together can be wonderful, and we've seen it has lots of positive effects, lots of benefits, but a well-rested couple is definitely the happier and more balanced couple, and it's better for your relationship. Mm -hmm. So I bet our viewers can't wait to hear some solutions to unlock better sleep. So let's go through some other strategies to actively work towards better sleep quality. Earlier, we already touched a little bit on drinking a tea, so that gets us into herbs. What herbs and supplements can help? Yeah, so again, addressing the root cause and knowing your individual needs is always really important. But some general things is, yes, tea. And again, being mindful of your bladder. If you do have bladder issues or, or waking up throughout the night, it might be better to go for something else. You could try a herbal tincture so that you're not having as much fluid before bed. You could try diffusing calming essential oils or, or something like that instead. I make my own sleep tea and my favorite herbs to use are lavender skull cap. I find that blend is one of my favorites and it's calming and, and helpful for sleep. And then Valerian is another one that can be really potent to help calm the system and, and go to bed. Uh, it's interesting. I've had some people have the opposite reaction to it where it prevents sleep. So again, there's always working with your individual needs there. But that I find can be a good option on nights where you're just having a really hard time calming down the system. And it's a very smelly herb. So I'll often recommend doing it as an herbal tincture. An herbal tincture, for those who don't know, is just an alcohol extract of the herb. So you're just taking a few drops before bed. And 
there's things like melatonin as well. A lot of people that I work with will go for melatonin because in your sleep cycle, that's one that I would say would be something to use temporarily, or maybe if you're a shift worker or something like that, but I would be careful not to sort of over rely on it. So working with why are you needing the melatonin? What's off there and how can we address that? Very interesting. Yeah, I've used melatonin just for traveling when you have a jet lag. Yeah. I think that would probably be using it with intention, right? That in those cases, it can help to get you back into the new time zone or back into your original time zone when you come home. Exactly. Um, that would be a perfect way to use it. And I think it's very interesting to notice that not everything works for everybody. I've never heard that Valerian prevents sleep for some people. So that's really good to know. So if you maybe are taking an herbal product that has different herbs in it, it could be that that's why it's not working for you because you have an individual response. Mm -hmm. Can I get back to exercise for a moment? So how much exercise would you say is beneficial for sleep? And more importantly, at what point during the day would you recommend it? And I'm asking because I'd like to go dancing. And that means that I often exercise late in the day. I realized that on those dancing nights, it takes much longer for me to wind down and get sleepy for bed. Would you say I'm not doing myself a favor with that? Is it not a good idea to exercise before bed? Yeah. So again, it depends on your individual needs. I find some people find exercising late in the evening helps them sleep. It really depends on the person. In general, I recommend doing exercise earlier in the day. Exercise itself is really important in helping to manage cortisol and, and the stress management response there. It's important to get the exercise in, but maybe at night it's better to do sort of light exercise, something that doesn't sort of raise your body temperature so much. And with that raising your cortisol, we talked a little bit about melatonin helping you sleep. So cortisol and melatonin have this Inverse relationship where when cortisol is up, melatonin is usually down. And so it's going to be a little bit harder to sleep. So you don't want to spike your cortisol before going to sleep. Cortisol in the average person starts declining around 7 p.m. So then exercising after 7, doing something that raises your cortisol would kind of interrupt that. So that's the theory behind that. Whereas if you're Kind of doing something light, you're getting some movement in, but not stressing your body out too much. So yeah, playing around with that, but being aware of the impact it might have on sleep. Yeah. And it's individual to what makes you feel good. That ultimately affects our sleep too. Good. Well, I think that brings us to the end of today's recording about this holistic approach to sleep. Is there something else you would like to add, Felicia, before we wrap it up? Yeah, I think that pretty much covers it. My main thing to get across would be to pay attention to your body during the day and at night and finding what works for you to help with sleep and address any underlying causes there too. Oh, thanks for the inspiring conversation, Felicia. I've definitely learned a lot. And thank you to the listeners or viewers for joining us. We hope these insights help you achieve a more restful and rejuvenating slumber. Please give us a thumb up if you like the information or share with your friends and family. And please don't forget to subscribe to the channel. For more information about us, you can go to either the Awakening Health website. That would be awakeninghealth.ca. On there, you can find Felicia, myself, also our colleague, Dan. You can also, if you want to reach out to Felicia specifically and find out more about her, go to her website. That's drfeliciaascensand.com or for myself, greendoorrelaxation.net. You will find all these links in the notes below as well. And that's it for today. So sweet dreams, everyone. Bye, Felicia. Bye. Thank you so much.